Oh, wrong way. Okay, well, hello and welcome uh, to the education night for June. Uh, tonight uh, we're doing a case study on a fire that occurred last year in November. And to present is going to be Nick Suro. He is from Greg Kelly and Associates and uh, he's going to show you what this uh, amazing investigation was all about and how he came to the final hypothesis. So we, we welcome Nick at presenting. Uh, thank you. And <laughs> Good evening everyone. So thank you for attending tonight. Um, as Nick said, um, uh, I work with uh, GK Investigation Group. I've been with the company for the past five years and um, my title is a Forensic Fire Examiner and in my last five years I've been fortunate to uh, examine over 300 and between 350 and 450 fires and some have been um, large loss fires in New South Wales and Victoria and this one is a, a very interesting case that um, myself and the FRIU were involved and also um, Jim Monday um, and the results at the end of the investigations were amazing so I'll run you through it so the fire was at Seven Hills I, I, um, because this is recorded and the case is recent so I won't mention the company names that were involved um, but everything else is included in the uh, presentation so I'll give you a bit of a background um, into this uh, presentation so a large fire had occurred on 3rd of November 2018 at 167 Prospect Highway in Seven Hills, which involved um, two commercial um, warehouses and uh, destroyed two commercial warehouses and caused damage of, yeah, I didn't have the exact figure, but if they estimated at that time it was between 30 and 50 million dollars worth of damage. Um, from the investigation, um, we determined that the call of uh, the time call for the fire brigade was at approximately 4:48 p.m. and um, evidence that we obtained from the CCTV footage from the surrounding buildings um, showed that the warehouse where the fire had started had collapsed by 1:20. So this is a very fast developing fire. So the complex at 167 um, Prospect Highway comprised of Twin industrial multi-purpose warehouses and their cafe. Um, along Prospect Highway faced northwest, so to make it easier to explain things um, in my presentation, I've orientated to face west along Prospect Highway. And the two warehouses which were um, fire damaged were located along the northern boundary. So the two warehouses were Unit 2 and 17, and as I mentioned, they were located along the northern boundary. Both units occupied a large surface area, which was over 5,000 square meters. And um, as we know, the fire was um, on the 3rd of November. We got instructed by the, insurance, uh, the insurer of the building and the complex, and I attended the site on the 5th of November in the morning. At the time, the site was still active, uh, fire uh, was under the fire brigade and was still an active fire zone. Um, there was an exclusion zone at both units, 2 and 17. <coughs> However, on site were the FRIU, the first to be there, to be there Tara and Chris Hughes were the um, fire investigators from Fire Investigation Research Unit and also the detectives from Blacktown Police. Um, there was not much I could do, there was an exclusion zone, I was only given um, initially permission to record digitally, no disturbing of the scene. Um, I was advised meanwhile that police were able to retrieve the CCTV hard drive from the office of Unit 2 and it was alleged that the um, fire was captured on the CCTV footage. 
Uh, so Tara, the, tech, the detectives um, went back, to watched the footage while I was documenting the scene and obtained other data meanwhile at the scene. It was later confirmed that the fire had originated from Unit 2 and then no <coughs> human um, activity was recorded. So the footage showed that um, the fire originated from pallets that contained quick uh, connect white fittings. So this is the white fittings that we have uh, for our ducted air conditioning. So um, these, type, these uh, fittings were made out of um, plastic and coated with foam. Um, they were stored on pallets and in the storage yard, storage yard of Unit 2. So, um, as I mentioned, I initially I obtained um, additional data, which involved, in, included footage from Units 3 and 6, which were the opposite from the subject Unit 2, and uh, further footage evidence showed that the first fire and, uh, and signs of smoke was from the open yard area of um, Unit 2. There, this was also important to um, document that no human activity was recorded from the outside of the premises and therefore we were able to eliminate that. No one had driven past or flicked anything over the fence and um, caused a fire. Um, so the first arriving fire brigade truck, they drive straight where the uh, area of origin is. So you couldn't miss it, you'll see on the videos. We parked the truck. This is important. I've included it in my um, slide because Mick was very interested in this footage for safety purposes. I believe we were going to do a case study for the fire brigade. Yes. Um, and you can see as soon as they park, it's just flames. But before you know, there's multiple explosions happening and the fire brigade officer is just off and running. Um, That's how you <laughs> Yeah. You would too. <laughs> <laughs> So during my um, examination, as initially mentioned, I attended on the Monday, which was the 5th. Um, I recorded it. I was still active uh, fire site. Um, I re-attended on the 7th to finish my um, examination, which included documenting this, the site in more detail. Um, during my examination, I found, you, you'll see the area of origin was totally destroyed. There was no evidence of any um, accidental ignition source or ignition source to explain the cause of this fire. And thankfully for the CCTV footage, we're able to move uh, forward. Um, so I've included a satellite image to um, give you an idea how large this site was. So this is 167, that's the industrial zone which comprised of the 20 units. And here is, um, I've zoomed in from the satellite, so that's the actual site. This is Unit 2. Unit 2 comprised of an office building area, a large warehouse, and an open storage yard at the eastern end. Unit 17 was off to the um, was located east from Unit 2. It was just right adjacent to the open storage yard. And that's just to I zoomed in photo even further into this area. So this is our open yard area where we have two Pentec trucks and pallets sort of all, of, all along this area. Is that a Google Earth or is that just... No, this is near map. Near map. Okay. Near so map how old yeah. was that photo? This was, I think, um, a, it was days. It okay, was yeah. day, so because this is the pallets that were actually yeah. there. Yeah. So that's exactly right. the same pallets that caught on fire. The only thing that's different um, in this photo from the footage that you're going to soon see is that this truck is no longer, not, it's not there. And this also confirms because you can see the shipping container there and the shipping container was still on site when we um, examined the, the scene and it was alleged that the um, pallets had arrived three days before the fire, that was the alleged um, information and it wasn't far from the truth. Um, what I'll do before I go any further, I will we'll show you the, the footage of how um, how the fire started, so you can see um, what the challenge the, the challenge that we had in determining the actual ignition source. And it wasn't hard to see where the fire started, but the hardest part was what caused this fire. So have you got? Yeah, this is yours. 
Previously, yeah, I'll carry on. So previously, as I mentioned to you, how important it was um, that fire brigade. Oops, one second. This will show the first arriving fire truck, and you can recall how I mentioned the importance of that, and this is why. Of course he hasn't got the metal on. No. <laughs>
to show you the, the actual CCTV footage from inside. That was recorded from the inside of um, Unit 2 showing how the fire had developed. But just in case, I included screenshots, which thank God. But anyways, um, I'll play things. This is to show the fire. That's the end result of the fire, which started around there. And you go to plan, I want to show you how it starts first there, and then how it caused all this fire damage. So this is unit two, that's the office area, that's the warehouse, and that's the open yard. And the pallets were located in this area. Um, the two shipping containers, used to um, bring the pallets for these two. Uh, they were allegedly brought in a few days before the fire. Um, and this, this is the area of footage that was recorded by FRIU. I'm not sure who did it. I did. Uh, well, Mark Hummel did it. Using his drone. He loves playing with his tools. Um, <laughs> and that's the area of origin that we have. So you can see, started there, and it's caused all this damage to two warehouses causing in excess of 30 to $50 million, including you know, the stock, but destroying both um, industrial units. Um, so this is what I arrived to on the 5th of November. I pull up there, still exclusion zone, <coughs> fire brigade is still attacking pockets of fire, and um, that's the warehouse. Um, this is the southern wall. And this is looking in, uh, this is looking west, showing that colla the collapsed southern wall of the warehouse, and that's where the office area is. So this, the whole warehouse of Unit 2 was totally destroyed by fire. Um, I was able to sneak in, sure enough. Uh, and taken some photographs inside there, um, zoomed in to show what sort of contents there was inside there. My boss won't be happy, but now we know why. Um, we know what was inside. There was a lot of um, air conditioning parts, um, predominantly for ducted air conditioning, so uh, splitters. Um, there was plane and boxes and all that stuff that um, this company had produced and distributed and sold. Um, now we're coming to the side gate uh, for the area of origin. This is to the open storage yard. Um, so here's the two side gates. So you can still see the uh, fire hoses that are still trying to put all the fire out. Um, and this is what I believe was the cause for the train on the video to speak English. That's the gas cylinder that exploded. It was located right next to the um, side gate. That's just one of them. That was one, <laughs> one hit the wall, pretty much adjacent to where the truck was parked, right? Um, didn't do damage to the wall, but yeah. Here's a photograph. So this is um, kind of the way to plan because I want to show that footage of how the fire started and would have showed you all the pallets, how they were lined up and what was inside the pallet. So this is a... Um, a wide fitting, a polyurethane, uh, which was coated in foam. Uh, this is the white splitter, the white splitter that we have in our ducted air conditioning. Great product, very light, um, and that was what was stored in the pallet. And you'll see some images. Okay, I have. Your video might not work, but this does. Um, so this is a screenshot that I've taken of the CCTV footage. So this is our outdoor storage yard, and you can see the storage yard is packed with these pallets. So these pallets were, um, contained 63 white fittings per pallet. Uh, it was nine um, white fitting per row, and it was seven rows high. The pallets were wrapped in transparent uh, pallet wrapping, 
and was stored outside. Um, they were delivered three days before the fire, that was the alleged uh, time, and it was stored outside because the warehouse was full. And um, this image was taken at 1247, showing, um, if you look here, I'm not sure if you can see it from there, um, smoke and flames are starting to develop on top of that um, pallet there. And you can see the gates are closed, the truck is there, there's one truck, the other one is gone, not, wasn't there. And I wish I could have showed you the video. We might, be able, we, we might be able to do it at the end. Um, and you can see there's no human activity and the fire just <laughs> develops yeah. from... Um, <coughs> Was it? Yeah, better. Oh. So the fire just develops from the pallet. Um, after watching this footage, I think we all started scratching our heads. How is that possible? And uh, that was, so mind you, I'll go back. So I want you to pay close attention. That's at 12.47. We have that. Um, the time stamp on the CCTV footage was 11.47, but I've established based on the um, fire brigade report, and that's what's um, crucial for us, private sector, to obtain the times, uh, because sometimes we get evidence, such as, such as CCC footage, which is out of whack. It's not, um, it's not aligned, um, and we can use uh, your reports and time of call as a reference point. Um, here's the screenshot showing the fire development, and that's the at 4:50, <coughs> and that's no human activity, no ignition source, nothing. Just the fire starts and progress, and you can see um, the progression of fire by 4:52, two minutes later, reached all the way up to here, and um, it started spreading to the Pentec truck, and I feel. Um, by a minute later, 4.53, the camera was engulfed in smoke and you couldn't see anything else. So very short time, the whole outdoor area was on fire. Um, what we, when I was watching the video uh, of the CCTV, I've watched it many times, um, my eyes were red, just trying to figure it out. I was zooming in, zooming out, just talking to my boss, who's also a mentor, and I said, well, I, I don't know what's going on. I said, you know, the start, I said, the start on top, there's nothing um, to, to indicate what caused it. And um, I'll explain why this is important, but watching the footage, I also noticed that um, there's actually evidence of water on top of the pallet. And this is right underneath where the camera was, and the Pentec truck is somewhere here, and the area of origin would have been um, the pallets that caught on, caught on fire were there. So this is right here. Um, you see this area is under shade because we've got a um, awning to the right, which was attached to um, the warehouse. And now this is a view showing you from the gate. So this is the side gate that you go into the open storage yard. So that's your Pentec truck. So over here on the corner was the approximate area based on the um, angle of the footage where the camera was installed. And this is the area where we had all those pallets. And somewhere here is the pallet that caught on fire first. Um, this is the awning area and the fire spread into the warehouse and destroyed the whole warehouse and the um, offices on the western end and also the fire spread in the um, easterly direction destroying warehouse 17. So this is, um, I'm just gonna include a few more photos. So that's what, when I went there on the 5th, um, this is before the actual area got even more um, this is what I found there. This is the original, not, di not disturbed. Fire brigade still attacking the fire. Um, that's unit 17. 
So the warehouse for Unit, unit 17 was, um, the western wall was running that way, totally gone. And this is, I'm not sure why it's so dry, but this is where the was left of the pallets. So um, there's not much to work with at the scene initially. So this is um, kind of the angle, I couldn't get up high to show you the exact angle of the camera, but kind of how the, the angle from the area where the camera was, and that's where the pallets were located, and the gate is just there, and that's the uh, common driveway that leads from Prospect Highway up into um, the complex and does U-shapes to all the other units. Did you have the footage by then? By the time you said that? that no. Okay. I had no idea. Okay. So when I took those photos, the only thing I knew by that stage that there's no human activity had started in that area. So I had no idea where we, where, what we were dealing with. I knew there was um, pallets, where exactly there were. The only thing I could make was just um, in the day, there was you know, a, um, witness marks from the timbers, some of the timbers which was mostly consumed. Um, besides that, I had nothing else to, to work with at, while, while examining the site. Um, but what was interesting while examining the site, I'm, I apologize, I didn't anticipate that this was going to be, <laughs> I wanted to do, yeah. Um, so while I was on site, um, we're gathering data and some of the data that we're get, gathering was that the company that operated from Unit 2 had a previous fire two months to the fire at um, Seven Hills. And their fire involved the same type of product stored on pallets. And the pallets were stored outside in, at their Cardiff um, premises, Cardiff, New South Wales, that's the Newcastle area. Um, so that, the, 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 um, the first fire they had, or which was, and I'm not gonna say their name, well, the company, it was um, approximately 2.18, so 14.18, on the 29th of, of September 2018. So the second fire they have at Seven Hills is on the 3rd of November, so very close um, in proximity. So that fire was not investigated. Uh, the, a cause for that fire was not um, therefore available for us. And... Um, Chris, who was, I guess, assisting you guys uh, at that time, was kind enough to drive to Cardiff, New South Wales. And um, he documented the area where the pallets were located outside and had caught on fire. And allegedly, they were all destroyed. So um, this is the, I'm not sure if, if it's their parking area and they had used it as a storage, but that's where <coughs> the pallets were stored outside uh, at their Cardiff warehouse and this is just a bit of a close-up that Chris was kind enough to take and all you can see is just burnt marks on, on the concrete where the pallets uh, were allegedly stored and by this stage we we knew we had a, um, a large fire at Seven Hills we had the same product which was the white fittings stored on pallets and they were stored on so uh, outside and this product had ignited twice. Um, same, the first time, it just destroyed the product. It didn't cause, um, as far as I know, any property damage. For the second fire, you saw that it caused between 30 and $50 million worth of damages. Um, so at this stage, we're trying to work out a hypothesis of how this fire ha uh, could have started. Um, the things that I started to think, okay, well, I know I've got the same product, so I'm, I'm starting to look at the similarities and differences between both fires. Um, the things that were available to me is the products, as I mentioned, were on, on pallets, they were wrapped, they were stored outside, um, and um, there was a brief mention, there was a hearsay mention while I was on site that the products were from Malaysia, um, that's where they changed the production line to. Um, and then I went to the drawing board and I said, well, what else is, what else is similar? So I looked at the historical, where the data 
for both sides to see um, what was the weather like at Cardiff um, when the days and on the day of the fight. So um, I noticed that on the 27th and 28th, so 29th is the date the date the fire occurred at Cardiff, 27th and 28th, I have 0.4 of, uh, millimeters of rain and 0.2 mil of rain. So I'm like, okay, so there's good, there's good, it rained two days before the fire. On the day of the fire, no rain. Um, I have um, wind, windy conditions, 56 kilometers um, wind. That was at about three o'clock, so before the um, actual fire. And the temperature was 21.6 maximum temperature that day. Um, and I, saw, I took that data with me and then I said, okay, well, what do I have at, sorry, that's the zoomed in version. So you can see, we've got on the 29th, the temperature reached up to 21.6, 56 kilometers wind. We've got no rain that day. But the two days before that, we have um, not a lot, but there is rain in the Cardiff area. Um, then I took that data with me and um, I said, okay, well, I haven't been to Cardiff and I don't know exactly how this site looks. So I used Nemap um, images to see where their storage and uh, parking area is. I didn't include that here, but the, I'm not sure you can make sense from there, or you can see it. So that's the warehouse, and in, in here is the parking and storage area that's outside. Um, so I said, okay, well, that's where the parking area is. I obtained the satellite image, and I said, oh, is that area exposed to the sun? And if it is, how long is it exposed to the sun? So this is a very good tool that I've used. I have, I've used it for a few jobs. A sun cal cal calculator. So what it does is um, you pinpoint it. So that's the approximate area where those pallets were located. See that um, dot that I've placed there. Uh, and then this yellow dot. I'm I'm terrible with the with the colours. <laughs> sorry, uh, but the yellow dot is about the um, two o'clock mark. And I've noticed and I've indicated it here. So that shows you that for the most of the day, until the you know the time of the fire, the pallets were actually exposed to the sun because you've got the east to west. So that's how the sun is going, and you can see the travel of the sun, and that's where the and there's nothing obstructing this area where the pallets were. So we've got full exposure all day to the sun um, where the pallets were located. I said. And then I did the same for Seven Hills. I said, oh, okay, um, actually I was in Sydney. I remember that day clearly, the night before that rain because I had to um, go to a box party and I drove past the fire, etc. And I said, I bet I'll investigate that and I did. Um, the night on the 3rd of um, November actually rained and it rained 5.5 uh, millimeters of rain in the Seven Hills area. So we had rain. Um, Later you'll see on the footage, the day of the fire was actually a very hot day. It was over 30 degrees and it was windy. Mm. The actual footage shows that, um, and you saw the um, screenshots of the pallets that were actually exposed for the most, most of the day on the sun. And there was, um, <coughs> there was strong winds because you can see the um, transparent pallet wrapping flapping right before the fire. You can see the gust of wind going through the open yard area. So that's just a little zoom in so you can see as the November 3rd, we've got 5.6. So I've got water available in both sides. So it rained the two days prior to the fire at Cardiff and on the night before the fire in um, Seven Hills. So I used the same tool the sun calculator, and um, then you can you can play around with, with this. It shows you how far the sun is actually from that point. So at the time of the fire, actually, the sun was directly above where the pallets are, which is the, the strongest time when the 
um, or that's the strongest time of the day. The sun is the strongest, I should say. Um, and it's all, we've got east to west, so you can see that part of that, and that's the dot there to confirm what the time of the day is and where the sun is. So that line there shows you where the sun is. Um, so from there, I determined that um, both sides were outside, both sides where the pallets were like located were exposed for the whole day to the sun and I have water available. Considering they had no other ignition sources, I, I then said, well, can this um, have anything to do with the cause of the fire? I, um, prior to that, before um, I did internet and um, literature research whether these wire fittings um, or whether there was any other cases of self-ignition, but there was nothing of that. So that was quickly out of the window. Um, and then I did a bit of research on the internet with the assistance of uh, my boss who was guiding me and told me that I need to have everything turned upside down and don't leave a page unturned when you forming your hypothesis. So I did that and there was great um, videos on YouTube actually uh, of people showing uh, how powerful the actual sun is. Um, from there, I um, before I formed my hypothesis, I um, concluded what my similarities are, which I just previously mentioned, um, and some included and are not limited to. Um, we were advised, even initially when I attended, that um, I asked what's different, what's the difference between this product and why they never had a fire. So what, why do we have a fire now um, and not before? And we were advised that um, the company that occupied Unit 2 had changed their production line from Adelaide in Australia to Malaysia. and. Um, both pallets that were in Seven Hills and Cardiff were the work from the production line in Malaysia and were shipped to Australia. So we had identical same product. We didn't have pallets from um, Adelaide, we didn't have pallets from Malaysia mixed. We were, all only had Malaysia. So we had similarities, all of the same product. As uh, mentioned, it rained at both premises days before the fire. The pallets at Cardiff. Uh, we asked the uh, owner of the business were they wrapped in their work. It was confirmed that um, the pallets were wrapped in transparent pallet wrapping. Um, they were stored outside, exposed to the sun. Um, and the temperature was between 21 and 33 degrees at both sides at, um, on the day of the fire. And both fires occurred between 12 and 2.30 p.m. Um, both fires lack apparent physical evidence of an ignition source. So we didn't have an ignition source at Cardiff, we didn't have one at Seven Hills when we investigated the fire. Um, then, obviously, we have a look at the similarities and the differences. So, um, establishing that they've changed the production line. So, what are the differences? Did the um, going to Malaysia producing this product has changed something in the product to um, st start causing fires? And that was I think a uh, great panic from Mick here because we need to determine if this product was safe, right? I never panic. Never. <laughs> you were sweating. Um, so in Adelaide, um, the white fittings were blow molded. So just the, the plastic to blow molded. Um, and the thing that I kind of wanted to find out is, okay, so w what do you guys do different than you did? And they told me that you know, in Adelaide, there were the um, wire fittings once produced, there were um, packaging cages or thrown in shipping containers so they were not tightly packaged, so it was in metal cages and then shipped up to their site. Um, so what changed to the production in Malaysia was that the wire fittings were injected molded, so there was not much difference between blow, um, blow molded and injected molded, it's just the finish of the product. So the inject the injected molded um, gives you a much smoother and nicer finish on the plastic. Um, so 
that wasn't much of a concern. Um, so what they also changed was uh, they started packaging these products on pallets. As I previously mentioned, they, um, on one pallet they could fit 64 fittings. Um, they used a corrugated cardboard uh, between each layer. There were seven layers of nine fittings per layer. Um, a machine was used to wrap these um, pallets in transparent pallet, pallet wrapping. They were plate, they were um, loaded on a shipping containers and then shipped to Australia. It takes approximately um, six weeks from production to, um, to arrival in Australia. And um, then became my hypothesis. So I said, okay, well, I knew I had water, I knew I had sun, I knew I had uh, transparent pallet wrapping, which if a water formed or a puddle of water was on top of the pallet, um, the sun rays will go th through, so it won't reflect or um, re re retract. I mean, it, the, the sun rays won't um, be reflected. Um, and then I came up with the hypothesis that a water from the rain had accumulated on top of the pallet, uh, the transparent pallet wrapping, creating an aqua lens. So, um, so you, the, the um, weight of the water, because the pallet is not tightly wrapped, it's a machine wrap on top, it's loosely, so it created that nice um, puddle and acted like an aqua lens. Um, and the water on top of the transparent pallet acted uh, as a focusing lens and magnified the sun energy onto a focal point. So, and then ignited the materials inside the pallet. Can we support this um, with a theory? And um, this is something that I was taken out of John and Finney. So we know that the heat flux from the sun hitting Earth is point seven to one kilowatt per square meter. So the heat release from the sun, we can't increase that, it's constant, um, but the um, heat flux can be increased if we focus uh, the energy from the sun from the larger surface area, so when we focus it, the same, same concept as using a magnifying glass. So we're using a larger surface area, focusing on a smaller surface area, and when you do that, um, you, increase the heat flux from that 0.7 to 1 kilowatt to 25 kilowatt per uh, square meter which will generate enough energy to actually ignite most, most, most combustible materials so I have the theory behind me to support this hypothesis so um, this is the roadmap after I uh, came up with the theory so this is the roadmap of how things progressed um, and when I suggested it. So in, in the background, so we found that um, this company had changed production on the 1st of May 2018 from Adelaide to Malaysia. So it took only up to September to have the first fire at, their, at one of their premises. So going back six weeks, it takes shipping from Malaysia to um, Australia by the time they set up maybe that might even be one of their first shipping they caught on fire. Not long after, we have the second fire, 3rd of November, uh, at Seven Hills, and in that, you can see a curved road. It took me a lot of reading, research, um, going back and forth, until I came up, came up with a hypothesis, and we had a meeting in, um, in these offices of FRIU, between FRIU, myself, Jim Monday, uh, there was, uh, from your office was Tara, mm -hmm. yourself, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not no, sure. So um, and on this day, on the 22nd of November, we exchanged um, all our data, IDs were discussed, so how we're gonna test, how it was, by this stage, we, we still haven't, we didn't have, the um, the answer. Right? So we're still looking and um, working towards a workable hypothesis. Um, from the time of the fire until the 22nd of November, Tara 
who did some um, research. She was doing some testing on the pallet. Um, can you tell us more yep. about that? Um, so we, uh, we got two pallets uh, delivered to our test facility at Londonderry and uh, we didn't put any water on them and they just left them out in the sun and they just put a couple of probes in just to see uh, what gases, if any, were off-gassing just from the polyurethane. Uh, those tests were basically negligible, ne negligible, that's the word. Uh, and so we realised that there were no sort of combustible gases or flammable vapours that could sort of potentially be exposed that may be ignited. So that was all ruled out from that testing. <coughs> And then <coughs> Silimi comes up with the idea of aqua lens and I brought it out for meeting. I said, well, I think the water, you know, I know that I did my research, you know, it rained, we have water available on both sides, outside. I presented the whole thing. I said, can we test a aqua lens hypothesis? And um, the company was kind enough to leave the two pallets that they donated to uh, FRIU for further testing and um, I have to thank FRIU for then agreeing to do the testing and research at their facility at Londonderry and that happened on the 17th of December. Uh, mind you, so we were trying to replicate um, the conditions that happened on the 3rd of November. We needed a hot day, windy day, we needed a pallet. Impossible. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of doubt be behind that. This is just to emphasize again, we did have evidence of water, pools of water on top of the pallet. Right? Um, wow. Is it too bright? Or not? Mm. Is it? Maybe, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure why. So these are the two pallets mm. that were um, given by the manufacturer and um, the tenant of unit two. And this was set up at London Dairy on the um, December, uh, 17th of December, 2019. Oh, there you go. It's not me, it's you. Yeah, it's me. Oh, it's he was playing it before he sabotaged. He was sabotaging my <laughs> presentation. <laughs> How dare you. <laughs> I don't know where you work. Um, so there are two pallets, you can see seven rows, nine, identical to what we had. Uh, packaged the same way, picked up from their warehouse and delivered to FRIU at London Derrick. Um, so what, I, what, what we um, did on that day was myself, Nick Forbes, uh, Jim Monday and Ellie from um, Jim Monday Associates. Um, we we didn't have rain, so we needed to create the puddle of water, the aqua lens on top of the pallets. Um, I used a bottle of water, which therefore we can measure how much water we actually um, in putting on top to create the aqua lens. So here uh, we began our testing at approximately 10 a.m. that morning. Um, you can see two puddles there. So the first one is a 300 mil, and then the second one is 600 mil of water. That's on the right pallet. Okay, this is on top of the right pallet. And then not long after, we can see a focal point over here, and this is the cardboard, the corrugated cardboard, which was used as a platform between each layer. So for the stability of the product, when they wrap it up in shipping, um, then they've used a corrugated cardboard <coughs> and a focal point from the sun was observed in this area between the white, fit, the white fittings uh, on the cardboard. Um, and this was the right pallet from the 600 mil lens. And uh, this was about 11.35. You can see the focal point was um, of the sun was moving as the, as the sun was moving the focal point was moving as well as the focal point was moving it was scorching and um, scorching the actual cardboard and the cardboard started smoldering so this was amazing hey we were high-fiving or jumping 
Unbelievable. Unbelievable. <laughs> We've got smoldering of the cardboard. We yeah, haven't got any ignition. <laughs> so what do we do? So what was um, what was saying what was different in the testing? So at Seven Hills, the footage shows that it was a windy day. Data, um, historical weather data shows that it's a windy day. If it's a hot day, we have a hot day. This day was 33 degrees when we're doing the testing at Londonderry. So it's pretty much the um, the, way, the the temperature is on point, but we have no wind. Um, Mick Forbes, kind enough, donated his uh, positive pressure fan. We connected a positive pressure fan from the right side of the pallets, blowing to the pallet to mimic the um, the wind conditions. Um, however, this was smoldering. So the sorry, the right pallet was smoldering, but it never actually ignited. We couldn't get it to ignite. Disappointed but we kept going. This is the left pallet, and on the left pallet we created only one aqua lens here in the middle. Initially, we um, this was only 300 mil of water. Yep, I was right. Um, and that was poured at, um, at the same time about the 10, 15 a.m. mark. And we didn't have anything happening to this pallet for a long time. There was not, not much really happening. Um, and at 11.37 a.m., we decided, okay, well, how about if, what will happen if we add a little bit more water? So to the 300, we added another 200 mils of water. And voila. So that's the aqua lens there. Created um, for the water puddle and created the focal point on the cardboard. And that was at 11.44, uh, was it seven minutes or something other like that, after we had added the additional water. Um, and you can see uh, the cardboard is actually scorching and the focal point, so it started from here and it's moving that way as the sun direction, as the sun is moving, so as the focal point. And um, this is inside the pallet, so, then we started having a lot more smoke build up. Smoke started to vent out. Um, the cardboard started to smolder more and more, but we still didn't have any ignition. We had the fan blowing, but we had the fan blowing from the right side of the pallet. If you can imagine, so we're looking at the back, and on the right side of the pallet, we had the fan blowing this way. Um, so the right pallet was protecting, this is the left pallet, so it was protecting the left pallet. So we didn't have that windy condition impact on the left pallet. So what I suggest is how about we move the fan to the front of the pallet so we have the fan blowing in both pallets from the front. So we did that. Hmm. And <coughs> we, when did we move that? Let me just move it for one second. Um, I think I have it here. I can tell you how, it didn't take long after we moved the fan um, until the actual pallet ignited and you can see how it's ignited at the top it started small, you'll, you'll see the video it started smoldering slowly, slowly, slowly and then we have full ignition I could say it was identical as the one we've seen at um, Seven Hills on the CCTV footage and it was high five hugs hooray we were able to replicate this hypothesis, which was um, regarded as impossible to do so, but we proved otherwise. And um, hey, we had more, more fun. I was with two, uh, I was with the fire brigade officer and investigators, and so we we decided, okay, well, let's do some uh, additional you know, mucking around. So we used a magnifying glass and thought, okay, well, let's see. Which one is the one that's the corporate? Is it the, the cardboard or the white um, white fitting? As soon as we played, um, Jim Munder placed the actual um, magnifying glass on the cardboard. The, guard, the cardboard started to scorch and uh, started to smolder. And it, it was out in the open, so you had um, abundance of air. So we had the heat, oxygen, and air. And just, you can see how quickly just 
starting to smolder and spread. It wasn't doing that in the actual pallet. I guess there was that oxygen part missing. Um, on the white fitting, we did that on the actual um, in insulation, which was on top of the plastic. It was scorching, but it, did, it just did not sustain flame. So it just didn't sustain flame when you remove the actual um, magnifying glass. And then this is the actual footage and the, the replication of that and the proof of the hypothesis that it can happen. Oh, oh, oh play that. Tell me you can play this. Hypothesis, hypothesis that uh, an aqua lens can ignite these um, pallets, which it did in pretty much the identical way as we had seen on the CCTV footage. Um, I, would, I must say uh, a big thank you um, to everyone that was involved because um, the private and the public sector working together, we were able to actually achieve all these results um, without. Um, working together, we were not. We were, I don't think we would have been achieving this result. Uh, so, FRA, you were very kind enough to quickly provide the um, footage, and then from there on, we all started sharing data, ideas, and hypotheses, uh, facilities um, to do the testing, and we were able to, I guess, solve a thirty or fifty million dollar fire. So is the company actually taking your advice on what caused it and they changed the process? Yeah. Not yeah. sure. Yeah. Okay, so that's the actual um, CCTV footage. The pallet. You can see that the, um, when, you when I zoomed in, that's where I had the water yep. on that pallet there. So that kind of proves to me that actually there was water on top of the pallet. Um, I want you to pay close attention to this area. Um, we can so in, in here, there's like very quick puffs of smoke yeah. initially come up. Um, we're actually examining the, the uh, actual footage the program allows you to actually zoom into that area. 
You can see the flame there. And then there's a flame there. So there you go. Pretty much identical to what we had the London Mirror. You see the flames there? There you go, the smoke. So that should be actually 1248. And then we have first signs of proper flames. And let me watch that. I guess I'd like to reiterate uh, also the uh, cooperation between uh, private and public. It worked very, very well. And um, do you remember what my comment was when you first proposed this hypothesis? <laughs> <laughs> no if and why not, that's it. That's why. So it certainly proves that um, you know, as fire investigators, you should keep an open mind mm -hmm. because uh, there are lots of possibilities out there. And I honestly thought, no, nah, this. I had heard of cases in the past um, of this type of thing happening, but so many things have got to go right for it to actually occur. So uh, I guess you know this is um, it's been amazing to actually prove that it can happen and it did happen. So um, there's no alleged in this; it's just uh, it actually happened. So uh, yeah. it was a great result, and then I guess I've been doing this for about 11 years, and uh, it's <laughs> one of the most uh, amazing sort of results that uh, I've ever seen. So it was uh, very very good to uh, be involved. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, as you can see now, and you can just see the, the you know, high fuel load here. And remember, that there's heaps of these more inside. <laughs> the full warehouse. The reason why they're outside <coughs> is because the warehouse is full. Yeah. Mm. So they're stocking up before the new year. It's November. Before the new year, they get all that. They're stocking up. And if I can say just the, uh, the testing at the end with uh, the product, uh, what it showed was that magnifying onto the black molded plastic, it just melted it. Uh, it didn't actually ignite it. And then magnifying onto the polyurethane, again, it charred it, but it didn't actually ignite it. Uh, but then uh, magnifying onto the uh, cardboard, that's what was the key. It was able to smolder, smolder, smolder. There's continuous supply there because it's all um, honeycombed. And, uh, and it just enabled it to get to a point where it was able to get the flaming ignition and that's where it is. But when you burn, when you when you put polyurethane and plastic uh, direct flame impingement on it, that's a huge, huge fuel load, and that's why you see this. Uh, it's it's hard to ignite it, but you put flame on it, and it's it's gone. Three minutes into it, yeah. That's three minutes. So what do you know? What time the first call was made? To triple zero for it. Twelve forty-seven, eight fifty-eight. Twelve forty-eight. And again, uh, the big problem uh, 48. for firefighters was the storage of all the, um, uh, the gas cylinders, acetylene, yeah. LPG, were in this location here. And that's why you can see them uh, venting, yeah. and those explosions yeah. were very significant. And we have like heaps more footage that we used. Um, mm. there's, there's footage from the outside that there was obtained from the other yeah. units. That shows these explosions, but we're not going to. Oh, if you have them, yeah, that's fine. The I, didn't, I didn't include them because it's. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll show you. But, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? questions? That is. Yeah. Uh, that glittering you can see on top, is that the wind um, moving the plastic? So if we go back, you can see the actual. You said it's glittering constantly. Glittering. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah. yeah. That, all that. That yeah. sort of suggests that the aqualands doesn't have to be stable because the, the water would be kind of moving around a little bit on top. Well, not really, because we introduced a positive pressure fence. So no, what no, I mean, so the, the, like some of the plastic base, right, and the yeah. water's on, on Yeah, the, the water's on top, yeah. And so it's moving a little bit with the wind, which means the lens, it's the aqua lens itself. Is well, you've got to, you got to, you got to uh, consider, so you have the uh, white fitting, right, and in, in, in the sensor it's hollow, so it's not a very tight wrap. And the weight of the water will, will form a bit of an aqua lens. So it will oh, form yeah, that, that, that. No, I understand that. Yeah. But what I'm saying is it's not static. It's mm -hmm. the, the lens itself must be moving a little bit with the plastic. We, the wind moving the plastic. Um, so, yeah. the wind will be in the bottom of the lens. So fire has arrived. They turn. They go past it. They turn around. <coughs> they back up. And he's, he's a, the driver's been in a bit. He goes, no, no, you've got to turn around. Oh, OK. Well, I'm going to have to go past it. Turn and actually do a Yuri. So that's when the, the guy was recording. 
Meanwhile, it's still going there. They set up, get the, uh, the SO, jumps out, just a quick, tries to do a quick, quick yeah, sizer, yeah. thinking, okay, this is not a bad spot. I'm protected behind it. He actually looked at that container and said, okay, that's a good area of protection. Look at the venting. <clears throat> he gets up there. Boom. And then he went, ah, nah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, get the hell out of here. Uh, so you got there, and then they like trying to get up. Uh, you're going to have to turn around. Three point turn. And then the boys uh, started to see a bit more. And then the, <laughs> the SO sort of said, yeah, get the hell out of here. Come on. Uh, <coughs> Fire is sort of walking away, thinking, ah, oh, this is just cool. we'll just back up over here somewhere. And then it's like, oh, we better move a bit quicker. And I'll be born. So that's what I had on the 5th of November because I went to the business. Opposite this unit, and I said, "Well, I can see you guys have a CCTV camera. Can I have a look at your footage?" And before I could see where and what ignited, this is what I saw. And I was like, "Well, that was fun." <laughs> um, but yeah, that's. There you go. Any other questions? Fire created from water. Who would have thought? Hmm. Hmm. So well, they firemen over there at the back of the car with their PPE on. No, they ran up. These two? Yeah, they, they, they ran up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, now just clearing this factory here, make sure everyone was out. You see already one um, cylinder there. Did they have a helmet on or something? It was hot. <laughs> it was hot. So about 20 minutes later, you'll see all these yeah, it's all walls will just yeah. collapse yeah. and <laughs> The building, went, <laughs> the building collapsed in, which was a good thing. Yeah, so uh, that's what it's designed to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Excellent. Any well, questions yeah, just for Nick? Like, where does the term aqua lens come from? Did you make that up or did you find that in a book? Or is that the thing you said? There, there's actually a little teeny. That's the teeny uh, Yeah. And you can see, there's many other cases. So if you actually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, there's, there was a case in London, actually, where the uh, sun was reflected from the building and, it, and was melting cars. Mm -hmm. So we know that the uh, reflection and refraction of the sun is got, uh, it has enough energy. And as I said, I researched to see what my similarities and differences are between both fires, and I found that I had water and I had the pellets exposed to the sun. I have no other ignition source, so what is it that's causing this fire? And I went in and read and I found that and I said, well, okay, well, if it's magnifying it, it's increasing at 25, um, from one kilowatt per square meter um, to 25 kilowatts per square meter of energy. So that's a lot of energy, which will ignite um, most combustible materials, which you did in this case, and we proved the theory right. Well done. That's yeah, good at that. I'm like Forbes, I, I didn't believe it, but now I've been here, <laughs> you won me. Yeah. And so, the next step for us is to, uh, we're trying to get the uh, an article into the IAAI's uh, fire and us investigate journal. So, okay. mm -hmm. hopefully that will get uh, get, uh, get a run on that. And then we'll put it in the Australian fire point as well. But, yeah, I've certainly sent this around to the other Australian uh, fire service agencies. Uh, just, just an awareness because um, mm -hmm. it's a very good documented case of it actually happening. So that's Not too often you have a camera that's right there filming the whole process. Exactly. Yeah. And if we hadn't had the camera, no, if we didn't, I, I don't think we were... Undetermined. Undetermined, yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Well, there was nothing left on the floor, mm -hmm. so what do I go by? But even with the camera, it was very difficult. Still, you can see still. how the fire started. Yeah. I can ask you, well, mm. what would you do? Or what, what would you have? Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. just starts like that. Got no idea. Yeah. Yeah. I initially thought right. it was the, had something to do with the uh, polyurethane. Either it was um, mm. uh, uh, off-gassing or being exposed to the sun. It's, it changes colour and... Well, it did this yeah, it discolored. It discolored. Yeah, so the foam itself was discolorated. Yeah. It was discoloration on the ones that. You, you uh, so that's a UV exposure. Thing, yeah. So, but you know, and then he did say, is it a manufacturing process, uh, you know, problem, or you know, it hasn't quite manufactured properly, and does that mean it's more susceptible to sunlight? Yes. We didn't know. So. So, was your client 
happy with the result that you're engaged to? <coughs> Good question. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, well, look, my um, I was representing the insurer for the for the, yeah. for, the yeah. for the for the builder. Oh, sorry, for the building. Um, well, they know the truth of what happened, yeah. and that's what it matters yeah. to me. And the owner was concerned, uh, obviously, because initially we thought it could be a product failure, yeah. and you've got hundreds and thousands of these in, in roofs all across yeah. Sydney and Australia. Yeah. So obviously, he was very relieved that that wasn't the case. Yeah. But still, it's a it's a massive dollar loss, yeah. and um, mm. but yeah, luckily you know, no one's been injured. And happy days. So. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for attending. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you, Nick, for your first time presentation. Hopefully, you can do it again another time. Well, thank you. Another case study. Uh, for everyone else, uh, we've got uh, an extraordinary education night. Uh, on the 27th of June, so the end of this month, it's going to be about Tesla vehicles and electric vehicles and their use and problems in fire investigation. Now, this is going to be at the Academy uh, in uh, Orchard Hills. So uh, it will probably come out in the next couple of days, hopefully. This weekend. And, sorry? This weekend. Though. Yeah, this weekend. So we will create an event as well for that. Um, uh, it's going to be at 5 o'clock start. Uh, out there, but all the details are there. It should be very, very good. We've got a guy, a Tesla guy coming from the US. He's doing a uh, speak for VAFI, the Victorian Association, and then he's flying to Sydney to do it for us. So that should be really good. And other than that, we've got our AGM in August. So I hope to see you all there. Thank you, and thank you, Nick. Very well done, and we'll see you again soon. <laughs>